We are ready now. Okay, awesome. Welcome everybody. We're still here celebrating National DNA Day, which was yesterday, we're celebrating today. Um, so our next class, which that's kind of sad is our, the last class of the day um, is titled Using DNA to Solve a Brick Wall, a Case Study, and it's gonna be presented by Debbie Gertler. We're glad you could join us. Before we get started, we do have a couple of those housekeeping items that we've been sharing with you. Uh, just a reminder, this class is being live streamed. So it's currently being live streamed to both the Family History Library's Facebook page and also at the DNA Basics Learning Center and also on YouTube. So we've had a lot of viewers today from various platforms, which has been quite exciting to, to have all of us come together for this one um, awesome topic. Just a reminder that Debbie is going to be answering some questions at the end of the presentation. So as we near the, the end of the presentation, feel free to share your questions in the chat or the comments. Uh, just a reminder, if you have a specific research problem, whether or not it relates to DNA, we do offer virtual consultations where we'll meet with you and kind of talk through your problem and give you some research suggestions. So to sign up for a virtual consultation, you can either go to the Family History Library's website or search virtual genealogy consultations on the Family Search Research Wiki. We just also want to remind you that there's a lot of great content about DNA that's available from rootstech.org, especially in the DNA Basics Learning Center. And that content is going to be up and available, from my understanding, at least until Roots Tech 2022. So you've got quite a few months to take advantage of all of that great content. So to access the DNA Basics Learning Center, go to rootstech.org, then click on the Expo Hall at the top right corner, and then scroll down to the very bottom where you see a section called Featured Booths. And that's where you can access the DNA Basics Learning Center. And that's where this um, presentation will eventually be um, uh, saved so that you can review it again. Now, this is the last of our DNA Day presentations. However, the Family History Library does offer classes on an ongoing basis. And the next class taught by the Family History Library is actually gonna be taught tomorrow morning, uh, Tuesday, April 27th at 10 o'clock in the morning, Mountain Daylight Time. The class is titled Using the Family Search Mobile Apps. So if you ever wanted to learn about the Family Search Mobile Apps, you can join us tomorrow. And information about the um, that class is available in the Family Search Wiki um, search for the Family History Library page. So let me go ahead and introduce our presenter, um, Debbie Gertler. Debbie works for Family Search, where she manages the Latin America, Southern Europe, and German Slavic teams at the Family History Library. She is fluent in Spanish and can read genealogical documents in Portuguese, Italian, and French. She is also the president of the Utah chapter of the Association of Professional Genealogists and holds four AG credentials in Spain the United States Mid-South Region, Portugal, and Mexico. So go ahead and turn the turn it over to, to Debbie. Debbie, are you talking? Uh, please excuse, we have a slight um, technical pro problem. We'll be resolving that shortly. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. I feel like I'm on a Verizon commercial. You know, my, I've heard perfectly all day until now. So sorry about that, folks. Let's go ahead and get started. So this case study is what I've titled Finding the Parents of Maddie Meeks. And yes, this is one of my ancestors, one of my southern brick walls. And so let's see how I was able to use DNA and traditional family history research to help solve the problem. I hope, I feel like I've solved the problem. All right, so the objective of the presentation is to learn how to use all the wonderful principles that we've been taught today to help break down an ancestral brick wall. 
and we're going to talk about identifying and isolating matches, building trees for your matches, crafting a theory, and then confirming your theory. So let's see how it's done. So as I mentioned, this is our research question. Who are the parents of Martha Maddie Meeks? Her family all called her Maddie, but her real name was Martha. So this is my starting information. I had an interview with my grandma back in 1977, and I've got a picture there of the yellow notepad that I used when I talked to her and she told me that Maddie was the wife of Robert Beck and also later census records I was able to determine that he was born before 1868 and that she was the mother of James born about 1868, Lisey born about 1869, Samuel Jesse born about 1871 and Frances Fanny or my grandmother's mother, born about 1875, and Benjamin, born in 1878. And I was able also to find a social security application um, claim index that's where Samuel Jesse Beck claimed that his parents were Robert Beck and Maddie Meeks. So that's my starting point. Now, because I'm going to try to identify and isolate my matches, because traditional research did not help me solve the problem. Maddie unfortunately died before 18, the 1880 census, so I was kind of stuck. So here's, this is my mom's tree and um, her initials are PJ in Ancestry. And so you can see there the information that I've built out and Maddie is down here in the bottom on the maternal side as the wife of Robert Beck. First thing I wanted to do was to eliminate all of the matches on the paternal side. So anybody that was connected to my Johnson or my Crowder lines, I wanted to eliminate those because they would not be helpful. And then as we've talked about earlier, we wanna isolate matches. And so I wanna isolate the matches for Maddie Meeks. And you'll see that this is her. Basically what I want to find are the, um, descendants or people who are connected through Maddie's siblings that that may help me to figure out where she where they're connected. So this is mom's DNA page on ancestry and just as a reminder throughout the presentation the names and the photos have been covered up or disguised so it doesn't look exactly perhaps as your page does but it's been done for privacy reasons. All right, here is a list of mom's DNA matches. And of course, the first one is my son, her grandson, um, who I also had tested. And then I have other matches that you go, as you go down the list, you can see more of her matches. Um, ideally, you're gonna wanna take a look at all of the matches in a normal situation and find those that share a large amount of DNA. But in this case, we had to take a little bit different approach because we gotta make sure we get to the right generation of the problem. So as we look here again at the tree, um, we can see that Maddie is pretty far back in her tree. So here's mom, grandma, great grandma, and great, great grandma. And so we need to find matches that are gonna be a little bit further back than the normal. So we need to find matches who descend, hopefully from the siblings of Maddie. And then hopefully we can find some information that will connect us to their parents. So there's Maddie down there at the bottom. All right, let's take a look at this match. This is match number one and match number one and mom share 405 centimorgans of DNA, making her a first or second cousin. Now, as you can see, by the surnames, this is on the wrong side of the problem gener generational. Well, not by the surnames, but it's on the wrong side of the problem generationally. I can't say that. She shares Maddie's DNA, but the most recent common ancestor is Maddie's daughter, Fanny. And so that means she also shares DNA with Robert Beck, with Mary Laura West and James Franklin Roten. And so it's not enough information to is isolate her to make it worth part of the study that we're trying to do to solve who Maddie's parents were. So um, in identifying their matches, and we've talked about this before, so this is gonna be a little bit of a review. Take a look at their trees and see if you can um, identify any similar surnames or similar locations. Um, create those color-coded groups that Beth taught earlier this day on Ancestry, those help a lot. And this um, case study that I'm presenting was completed almost entirely using um, ancestry DNA and ancestry trees. Um, if they don't have a tree 
in Ancestry connected to their DNA results. Be sure to view their shared matches to see who they have in common. And then, as I mentioned, look for the, in this case, I looked for the Meek surname. Now, that doesn't always work in every case to look for similar surnames, especially if you got Johnsons like I do, or Smiths, or really common names. Um, but I decided to look for that in this case, as long as they were in the same general area where I knew Maddie and her family had lived. So be sure to look at the locations as well. Now match number two, as I pull him up, I can see based on their tree that he is on the Crowder Johnson lines, which is the paternal side of the family. So if I click on shared matches, I can view others who share this DNA and put them all in a group and eliminate them because they do not match on the meek side of the, the family tree. And so this is a way to isolate those and eliminate them as possible matches that will help me to solve my problem. There's the shared matches button. Now, um, so this is match two shared matches, and then I can add them all into my Crowder Johnson group. Note that the second match on the list doesn't have a tree, but I can see who sh he shares matches with, so I can eliminate him and go ahead and add him right into that group. So here, here are um, the matches for um, match two. And you can give your matches in Ancestry a colored dot representing a specific ancestral line. This allows you to see at a glance which line this match belongs to. So you can create those color coded groups. And this is exactly what I've done with my mom's ancestry. And there you can see my different groups and how many matches within parentheses I've added within each of those groups and the colors that go with them. I may though, after watching best presentation, go back and recolor mine. That's, I'm just kind of OCD that way. All right, so as I pull up matches and this is the tree for match number three, um, I'm looking for the Meek surname, and I'll blow this up so you can see, sure enough, there's a John Neely married to Artemisa Meeks, and the parents are Jesse Meeks and Sarah Darius or Darius. So that's interesting. That one is, is got a Meek surname, and as I look more closely at it, they also lived in the same area where Maddie Meeks lived with her husband, Robert Beck. So the next step to take a to do is to take a look at who's left um, and then see who matches with, with this guy. So here are some of his shared matches. And I will point out to you because you can't see them on there that the starred matches on the screen are managed by the same user. And I've covered up that username to protect their identity. But that's a bit of a clue in and of itself that they are that those two test takers are related because they're managed by the same person. Okay, so once um, I've started to isolate my matches and I know the ones I wanna focus on, this is where you get to start building those quick and dirty trees for your matches. So here are some of the matches that I want to start building my trees for. And you'll notice that some of our matches have un, might have unlinked trees. This doesn't mean that we won't be able to find tree information, but rather we might not know where they fit in that tree. So when they have an unlinked tree like that, click on the words unlinked tree, and it'll take you to a page that shows you some information and it shows you a tree that's associated with the account. Um, once you click on that tree, you'll be taken to it and then you can take a look and look for matching the information. As you can see, there's a Narcissus Meeks in his tree. Using this information, we can build a tree tracing back to John Neely and Narcissus Meeks. Um, when working with a relationship that's further back, it's a, the, these most re recent generations aren't quite as crucial, except in the fact that you wanna make sure you get the right general, generational connections. All right, now some of our matches might have no tree, like this one right here. This DNA kit is managed by someone else. What can we do here? Well, if I click on that match, I've brought to this page that says the match has no searchable tree. 
but it shows me, and I've blocked it out and just put username, the name of the manager of that DNA test kit. So I can copy or write down the username and do a search for that person on Ancestry.com. So I can try to maybe get in touch with them or to see what other trees this person may have built under their own account. So there's the username. And for the, for the to, in order to find or do a user search, if you'll click on search at the top of Ancestry and at the very bottom of this menu there, you'll see an option to do a member search. So you're gonna click on member search and then you're gonna start typing in that username. And as you start to type it in, some options are gonna come up and choose the one that matches what you need. Now, obviously username wasn't the person's real match. I've, I've covered it up to, for privacy purposes, but I did find the username in the using the member search right there. And so as I, here is some information that I found about the user, including the family trees that they have created. I can also see how she matches with mom and other user kits that match for which she is the manager. Now, what tree should I focus on first? So I think about the surnames that we've already seen that have Meeks individuals. And I know that I have seen De La Salle and Neely in the tree for match 12. So let's go ahead and try right there. So there's that match. But if, that, if I did that one and it turns out it's not a match, I could try one of these others as well. She has, this user has quite a few good trees here that I can explore. And because she's managing these kits and she matches mom, I know there's probably some, some connection there that I need to figure out. All right, so here I am on one of these trees and notice the, the De La Salle names are on there. And notice we've got some Meeks and we've got Artemis again. And then also I wanted to point out uh, match number four. Her name matched exactly to one of the names of mom's matches. And I'll explain a little bit more about that one in a minute as well. But as I look at this tree, I can see, I see a lot of the same ne names that I keep seeing. There's John Neely and Artemis Meeks and there's Jesse Meeks and Sarah Darius or Dar Darius. So there's that in her, um, the bottom half of the tree there. All right, and there's the De La Salle and Neely. And I suspect because I, mom had a lot of matches on this line that they had a non-parental event in their, in their family on, under Artemisa, not further back. And that's why they chose to do a lot of testers because mom had a lot of matches that connected with this family. All right, and there's that match number four. Let's take a look. So here are some other matches that are managed by that same user. Um, so there they are right there. And then this is the one that is match number four that we just saw. And then as I did some further research, I found that she died in 2019, but she tested before she died. And so the test is under her name, but I'm still gonna conceal her name to protect her identity. So all of these um, matches are in common and share those same common ancestors. So here's a little summary of the information that I was able to glean as I built those trees. Here you can see the test taker, the amount of shared DNA, the most likely relationship based on DNA relationship calculators, um, so I would use the shared center Morgan tool to figure that out. And then I also indicated as I built, built their trees, the meek ancestor or ancestral couple that they connect back to in their trees that I found or the trees that I built for them. So my next steps were to go through many of these meek matches that had trees or for which I could build a tree and begin to connect them into one big um, tree. And I call this mom's DNA matches tree. So, and I built this out on Ancestry. So I'm linking all of my matches into this one particular tree. Um, Cause I want to be able to use this tree 
to create my theory and to use the tools found on DNA Painter, like what are the odds in order to help me uh, figure out a good hypothesis to confirm my theory. So um, what I have liked, what I like to do is to connect all of my matches into this one tree. And in order to do that, when you pull up a match, click on this little button right here, and you have to do this after you've put them in the tree, that will bring up an option that will allow you to search for that person in your DNA, tree, DNA matches tree. And then you can search for them and add them into the tree. So so go through the next step, connect all your matches into your tree. And you can tell when they've been connected on your matches list because they'll have this little blue icon next to their profile picture or their little um, blue or pink tile there. And that will indicate whether or not they've been connected to your tree. And at any time, you can click on that little blue button and it will show you how they're connected into your tree. So this is match number three and I can see how He's connected and you'll see here's Artemisa Meeks and John Neely and he comes down through the, the De La Salle line. So there's the, the co common ancestor there. As we go to the next one, this is match number four who also happens to descend through, that, through Artemisa Meeks who was married to John Neely. And they have identified her parents as Jesse and Sarah Darius. Um, this is match number five, and I, and oops, let me back up there for a second. So this is match number five, and again, you can see John and Artemisa, and then in match number six, um, we have Narcissus, who is a, happens to show up as a different sister, a sister to Artemisa, and, but she's also identified as a daughter of Jesse and Sarah. Here's match number seven. And again, back here, we can see that she descends through Darius Meeks, who is a son of Jesse and Sarah Darius. So you're gonna to wanna to try to continue this process for all your matches. Um, as you do so, you, you're gonna to start to craft a theory because you're gonna to start to see connections pop up and you're gonna to start to realize um, who the common ancestors are, the ancestral lines are, and that's going to help you to be able to decide where to place this person and where to go in and, and do further regular genealogical research to figure out how they're connected. So um, this is my theory is based on the things that I found that Martha Meeks is also the daughter of Jesse Meeks and his wife, Sarah Darius or Darius however she pronounces it. But what I need to decide now is does the DNA and further research confirm this? Because DNA alone is not enough evidence. We have to add that with sound genealogical research to confirm or to disprove the theory. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you can do to confirm your theory. Um, always, you know, sound genealogical research coupled with DNA tools, like what are the odds are some of the things that you can do. So first thing I did, and just to kind of review, to help you to remember what we already knew from the interview with grandma that I did back years ago, I knew that she was married to Robert Beck. Um, I knew that she had James, Lisey, Samuel, Jesse, Fanny and Benjamin as her children. And I found birth years, I found them in census records in um, 1860 and 1870. Um, I found um, a social security applications claim index where Samuel Jesse Beck identified his parents as Robert Beck and Maddie Meeks. Um, I know from other research that Robert Beck married first in 1856 in Arkansas. Um, the family in the 1870 census is found in Ward 3 in Claiborne Parish, Louisiana. And then sometime shortly thereafter, they moved to Arkansas. But sadly, Maddie died before the 1880 census. 
So that's some of the information that I have found in my research on the family. So let's do some research also on our proposed father, Jesse Meeks. So in the 1850 census, in Mac I found him in McNary County, Tennessee, and he had 12 children. Now I've just listed a couple of children here, the ones of most interest to me. So we have Jesse, the father, presumed father born in, for, born in South Carolina, and he was about 49. And we have Sarah, who's 39, born in Georgia. And then two of the daughters that I'm interested in, because I, you know, I think Martha is my Maddie, and Melissa is a, uh, an ancestor of one of my matches. So Melissa was 10, born in Georgia, and Maddie, or Martha, was born in, um, was five, born in Georgia as well. So let's go on and see what else we can find about them. In the 1860 census, I found Jesse Meeks and his family living in Drew County, Arkansas. And I will point out that in later on, um, Robert Beck and his family settled in this Bradley Cleveland area of Arkansas. So very, very close by, they lived in and around this area most of their life. In the 1860 census, I found Jay Meeks, age 60, born in South Carolina. I found Sarah Meeks, age 45, born in Georgia. And then I have MC Meeks, who was a female, about age 14, born in Georgia. And I believe that is Maddie. And then I also noticed they had Narcissa and Artemisa Meeks, age six, who were twins that were born in Tennessee. And several, a multitude of mom's matches go back to these two sisters. And by the way, my mom is a twin, although I don't know if that's related to this because she's not an identical twin, she's a fraternal twin. And I don't know if these guys were identical or fraternal, but it's interesting that tw twins ran in this family and my grandma had two sets of twins. Anyways, carrying on here. So in the 1870 census, in Jesse Meeks was found in Ward 3 in Claiborne Parish, Louisiana. Um, Robert Beck and his wife Maddie are also living in the same ward in the same parish in Louisiana. And in 1860, Robert's father is living next door to J.A. Meeks's family in the same place. And further research, I found that J.A. Meeks is actually Joseph Anderson Meeks, the son of Mark Meeks, a brother of Jesse. So I'm getting this fan club going, this um, connection of the Meek family. All right, so here's was a few um, problems that I, that I ran into, a few little brick walls, mini brick walls. I have looked everywhere and cannot find Robert Beck in the 1860 census. Um, I've looked in Louisiana, I've looked in Arkansas, I've looked in Tennessee. Um, I'm just not sure where he is. Just before 1860, he's living in Columbia County, Arkansas, where he married for the first time. And Columbia County, Arkansas does happen to be right across the border from Claiborne Parish, Louisiana. The other issue that I find is that Martha's age in the 1870 census, when she's uh, married to Robert and living there as a married wife with a couple of children doesn't align or doesn't match up with the Martha or the MC Meeks that I find living with Jesse in the 1850 and 1860 census. Um, my question is, was she really 35? By previous census calculations, she should have been 25. Um, and she was a young mother of two young children, age one and two. It's kind of unusual back then for somebody to wait that late to be married, but it's possible. Um, I do also know that she ends up having three more children, which would make her 44 when she had the last one. Now that's not physically impossible. My mother-in-law had a, a child when she was 42, I believe. So it's not impossible, but I want you to take a look at the written age in the census there and take a look at that funky looking three that he's written for Martha's age. It almost looked like he started to write a two and, and got carried away or he wrote a three and then he meant to change it to a two or maybe it's just a big flourish. I don't know, what do you think? Um, some other possible evidence that I found is the naming of their children. Um, the first male, James, was named after Robert's father. 
The first female was named Lisi after Robert's mother. The second male was called, named Samuel Jesse. Now, if Jesse was her father, that may be where the Jesse comes from. And I did find in this family of Jesse Meeks that they had a young son named Samuel who died at a young age. Um, it could be that they named their second male after this brother who had died, this young brother and her father. So my next step, now that I've looked through all the records and I'm still looking through some lands and deeds and things, but I have yet to find a probate for Jesse or anything where he outright states that Maddie, who was married to Robert Beck is his daughter. Um, so next step is to turn to the what are the odds tool that's found on DNA Painter. And we've seen a little bit about that earlier. Um, you can use it with a free account. You can use it here to build your DNA matches tree. And then you will want to add in the shared centimorgans for each match and then start adding in some various hypotheses. So uh, I've decided that I will test my theory uh, using the what are the odds tool found on DNA Painter. So this is the DNA matches tree that I've gone through and entered into what are the odds. And you will notice that I've added the amount of shared centimorgans to each match. Um, you can add usernames if you're doing it for yourself. For this presentation, I've anonymized the names and given each match a number. So what you're going to do on the tool is you're going to start by putting in what you believe to be the most recent common ancestor or the MRCA. And in this case, in my theory, I think it's Jesse, Jesse Meeks. And then I'm going to go through and start adding his children. So I've, I, he had 12, but I've just identified the ones that my mom's matches connect from. So we've got Artemisa, Maddie, Melissa, Narcissus, and Darius. So this is Artemisa in the What are the Odds tool. And you can see all of the matches that I've been able to connect back to her in the tree and their um, amount of shared centimorgans. And for the most part, the amount of shared centimorgans aligns with their relationship that they should have according to the shared centimorgans tool with mom. Now, these are the rest of the siblings and you can see their matches. There's not as many matches on these, uh, this side. And if I wanted to, I would probably reach out to some of these people and find other people to test as well to confirm matches. And you can see here I've got mom in her place as a, a, a descendant of Maddie Meeks, of a great granddaughter. All right, now that I've got all of that information in the tree, then I can start adding my hypotheses. So my first hypothesis is, well, what if mom's a descendant of a child of Artemisa that I don't know about? And so I put her in, I put the hypothesis in right here, and it tells me, uh, it's possible. It could happen. Statistically, it's possible. Next, I decided what if mom was a descendant of a brother or a sister of Jesse? And so I put her in. I put the hypothesis in down here at the bottom. And when I put it, the hypothesis here, you'll notice it's the wrong generation because mom fits in this generation right here. But this is statistically possible. But when I put her in the right generation, it's not statistically possible for her to be um, a descendant in this position of a sibling of Jesse. Now, could Jesse have had a really younger brother, perhaps, and, and she descended that way? It's, it's possible. But let's try some more theories as well to see what else we can find. So next, I have put my hypotheses where mom is in the tree as a descendant of Maddie Meeks. And this hypothesis has a huge score. This seems really likely. Now, don't forget, there could still be more likely hypotheses. But think about the places uh, based on the shared centimorgan where they could fit in the tree and try it out. You can also use, um, they've got a new feature on here, a suggest hypotheses. If you want help suggesting possible hypotheses and see how the hypotheses play out and how they work. So that's also a possibility that you could try. And that is another part of this tool on another part of the options on the what are the odds tool. 
Now, some of you may wonder about through lines. Now, of course, we know that the trees on Ancestry, uh, they could be accurate, they might not be accurate. So it's, um, if whether or not through lines is accurate depends on the accuracy of the trees that you find in Ancestry. Um, when I put in the through lines for, for Martha or Maddie Meeks, um, it didn't really confirm much of my information. But when I went on and after I added in the tree information for mom and connected her in there and put the information for Jesse Meeks, it would appear very likely that Maddie is the daughter of Jesse Meeks. Here is one side of the through lines and you can see um, mom is down here. And then I'll show you the other side of the trees, uh, the through lines, all of these different matches that all connect back through Jesse Meeks. So I could go back through and, and analyze all of these as well, but I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident that um, Maddie is the daughter of Jesse Meeks. I will tell you that I also looked at census records. Were there any other Martha Meeks in the area? I couldn't find any. Um, the, the thing that had always thrown me off was this, the census age. And so using the DNA, I think it, it's helped me to figure this out. So my question to you is, what do you think? Do you think I'm, I've got a solid leg to stand on here? Or do I need to do more research? I'd love to get your feedback. So just as a reminder of the things that we've talked about, both in this presentation and throughout the day, um, you can use the principles taught today to help you to break down an ancestral brick wall. You need to, um, besides testing your DNA, you need to identify and isolate your matches, build those quick and dirty trees for your matches, craft your theory about who you think the unknown parent might be, and then do some more research and use some of these what are the odds tools and shared Santa Morgans and perhaps maybe even segment matching, which we didn't talk about, to see if you can confirm your theory. It's really important that you remember, though, that DNA is not the magic crystal ball. It's just another tool in our genealogist toolbox. We still need to use it with sound genealogical research so that we can uh, try to confirm these theories. Don't let DNA stand on its own. Make sure that you have some, pair it with some good genealogical research. All right, we have some time for questions. Thanks, Debbie, that was a, a great presentation. Um, we do have a few questions and I'm sure we'll get a few more if you want to ask your questions in the chat or in the comments. Um, Paula on Zoom asked, is there a place on Ancestry that you can enter tree information that is not confirmed and may have a lot of garbage in it to do the quick and dirty, what we've kind of been talking about? I don't want to put garbage in the system unnecessarily. Well, one of the things that you, that you could do is just to create another tree. And if you make it, if you make it private, you're the only one that's going to see it. And you can use that to go in and play and, and create these trees and make them quick and dirty. And, and then later when you're done, when it's run its course, you are welcome to delete it. If you're, if you're using really unsubstantiated information, I think your best, best thing to do is to make it private so that the tree copiers out there won't copy your, your data in case, you know, it's not true. Yeah, definitely. I, I do the, the same thing. And I also do set them as um, unsearchable so that nobody else ever finds them accidentally. Mm -hmm. um, so I have another question on Zoom. Does the WADO tool meet the standards for genealogical certification? And what other tools would this would be this level of standard of proof? Um, the WADO tool will help towards meeting the genealogical proof standard, but it's not a standalone. You have to combine it with research and eliminate all possibilities and do thorough documentation of, of everything. It's, it's not a standalone tool. You, you've got to combine it with 
um, good research principles, um, making sure that you look at every possible source and every possible document. Now, would I say that what I've done on Maddie Meeks meets that, that GPS standard? No, I think I still got plenty more research to do, but I think it's given me really good um, background and a good basis to start digging in and exploring more fully the, the matches that I've identified and how I can connect them. So I, I think that, wouldn't you say that helps, that answers that one, Beth? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, a, it's a good foundational tool, but you'd have to do a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Irma and Zoom asked, does WIDO assume there is no endogamy? Um, I, I don't believe it. WIDO works good with endogamy. I don't believe it, it takes that into account. What's I don't think experience? so. I haven't, I haven't seen that it ever, it's quite yet able to handle endogamy. I think a lot of yeah. people, um, well, I should say a lot of tools, endogamy is such a complicated situation. I'm not even sure that we really figured out exactly how to deal with it in terms of solving DNA problems. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and Rachel on YouTube asked, would these same steps work with British Isles research? They should. They should work in with, um, as long as you're following the same research principles, I don't see any reason that they wouldn't. You know, my only concern would be making sure you had enough matches to build a good, a good database and a good matches tree. Um, Katie on Zoom asked, what is the blue icon on a person's match that looks like an hourglass? Hmm. I don't know I'm that I'm 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 wondering if she's talking about the connect link, the one that yeah. when you've connected the matches. The one that I showed earlier. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's probably it when you've connected them into a tree. Let me go back to that slide and see. That's that's no that well I don't know if that looks like an hourglass or not. Is that the one she was talking about perhaps? No, go to go forward. Right there on where it says match three. He has a Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's that's the that indicates that they've connected in I've connected them to a DNA match in in on my mom's DNA results. Okay, um, Shelly on Facebook um, asks, this is it's a Y DNA question. What are other the other possible reasons for different surnames showing up as Y DNA matches other than non-paternal events or surname changes? Oh, I'm not sure I know the answer to that, Beth, do you? I, yeah. Those would be the, those would be the two reasons that I would think of would be they've changed their name or a non-paternal event. I think the other thing with um, Y DNA matches that we sometimes forget is that uh, some of those Y DNA matches, the common ancestor might be before the adoption of surnames in Western culture. So if you have, especially if your genetic distance is larger than three or four, depending on the number of markers you tested at, you might be looking at a situation in which, you know, you had two brothers and when surnames were adopted, they took on different surnames. And so you are, it's not quite surname changes in the same way. Um, in, instead, it's a, a situation where that, that common ancestor is just way further back in time. Mm -hmm. um, a YouTube question, which is best to start with? DNA Painter, what are the odds or the shared Centimorgan project? So what are the odds and the shared Santa project are all part of DNA Painter. So it's all one, it's one website with um, various tools. I would suppose it depends on what your, what your end goal is. Um, shared Santa Morgans can help you to identify possible relationships. I wouldn't use what are the odds tool until you've built at least a few trees and you can start to form a hypothesis. So you probably want to start with shared Santa Morgans to identify relationships, building their trees. And then once you've built out several trees, then plug it all into what are the odds and go from there. Awesome. Um, 
so Sherry on Zoom said, where can I reference the genealogical certification criteria? So if you'll, if um, I know that the Board for Certification of Genealogists has added DNA into their latest standards manual, you can look at it there. Um, you might also check the other, depending on which credentials you're looking to get, check the other websites to see what their standards are for using DNA in research. Okay, great, yeah, great suggestions. Uh, um, Pamela on Zoom said, when using others' trees, is there a way to determine the validity of their trees? I see some trees that seem to be copies of my own tree, which does not provide new or verifying information for me. Probably the first thing that I do when I look at a tree is to look to see how many sources are attached to that tree. I don't know if they, if they put in a lot of sources and I can go in and look at those sources then uh, and then I can make my own determination. If they don't have very many sources or their source is ancestry trees, um, I probably will just skip that one unless it's the only one that I can find. And then I will take it with a grain of salt and I'll look at what they've got in their tree and then I'll try to do my own research to, to validate the information. Check their sources. That's the best thing you can do. You know, one of our favorite sayings at the library of gene genealogy without sources is mythology. So <laughs> yeah, definitely check those sources. <laughs> I, I do the same thing. I oftentimes as I look at any tree, I'm definitely counting the sources and, and determining are they all ancestry tree sources or are they actual records? Uh, so we had a couple of questions on Zoom asking you to kind of go back over how to connect the DNA results to the tree. Okay, sure, let me, all right, let me pull, share my screen again. I'm gonna pull that slide up again. All right, so, let, so you've picked up, let's say you're looking at one of your matches and you've already added this match into your tree. Um, there will be a little button right here next to that person, that match's name. And when you click on that, that little button, it will, let's see, it will take you to, or it will open up this little sidebar, which will allow you to search for that person in your DNA matches tree. And so you just start typing in the name and once you found the right person, click on that name and then it will automatically um, add them as in your tree. And you'll see this little button here that shows it that they've been added into the tree. So start, start with that person's match, assuming you've already got it in the tree. You gotta put them in the tree first. But once you've got them in the tree, then go to that person on the match and then find them in your tree. And you can give them the username and you can identify them however you want in your tree, but that, that will allow you to be able to enter them into your tree and connect them to your larger DNA matches tree. Wonderful. I think we are just about out of time. Thank you so much, Debbie, for your great presentation. Well, thank you. It's been fun. This is the first time I've given this. So if you have feedback to make it better, please let me know. Um, so just as a few kind of reminders. Um, thank you. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us today. This has been a fun experience as we've um, tried doing a DNA day. This is only our second attempt at kind of celebrating DNA day with a bunch of classes and hopefully we can continue that in the future. Um, just a reminder, the class, the classes were live streamed and they're available on the Family History Library Facebook page if you want to review them now and then they will be added to the DNA Basics Learning Center on Roots Tech. Um, and a reminder that if you have a specific research problem, we really do encourage you to sign up for a virtual consultation because then we can take a look at it and really evaluate you know, your problem and give you some personalized suggestions on what you can do next. Um, and a, yeah. um, I'd, like to, I'd like to give a shout out to Beth for organizing this for us on behalf of the library and for Brandon, who's always behind the scenes keeping our technology running. Thank you both. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks to all our presenters today. And also that we've had some great um, moderators who've been hanging out in the chat, whether it's been on Zoom or Facebook or YouTube.
they've been there answering questions and passing questions on to us so that we can ask the presenters. So we've really, really um, brought quite a few of our uh, library spe research specialists together today to do this. So I'm grateful to everyone who's helped out because I hope that's made it a better experience for those who are watching on the different platforms. Um, but we do encourage you to, to keep an eye out for the upcoming webinars. We do have that one tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. on using the Family Search mobile apps and we'll continue offering presentations on a variety of topics throughout the remainder of the year. So um, thanks again for joining us. Good luck with your DNA research and we'll hope to see you in a virtual consultation. Thank you, Beth, and goodbye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.